Hello everyone, my name is Juan. I'm a technical writer here at Google. I work, I write documentation for Google Cloud, specifically a Cloud Firestore, if you've heard of that. So today I want to talk about uh, visualizing doc links. So I built this uh, tool chain that lets you visualize the inline links of different documentation pages. So very quickly, uh, it takes a documentation page, extracts the links, and lets you see um, how pages are linked together. And from here you can um, elaborate pages and explore how your documentation is linked together. Or if there's a particular page you're interested in, you can isolate it and see just the links for that page. So, um, I wanted to talk. No, it's uh, not real time. Um, not yet, at least. So, I wanted to talk about uh, why I built this tool chain. And it's because my uh, TOC failed me recently. Uh, one, of my one of the developers for my product was testing the documentation. And he pointed out that there was uh, information missing in the procedure he was looking at. Now, that information uh, did have a documentation page but it was uh, buried in the TOC. It was uh, one level down, so he did not find it. And so that let me know that I needed to add, I needed not only to add that link to my documentation, but I needed to add more links throughout my documentation because this is a new documentation set. There are going to be other links I missed. And so that's what inspired me to um, create this tool. Um, one lesson I took from that from, from that was that you can't depend, you can't depend on the left hand TOC or search for your users to navigate. Um, you really need inline links because that's, that's um, the, probably the most useful way for users to navigate through your documentation. A good model for that is uh, Wikipedia, which as you know, doesn't have a left hand TOC and yet when you're on the page, you quickly lose hours as you find related information inside uh, through inline links. And so just very briefly, I built this using a Python and semantic media wiki. I use Python to extract the information from the documentation. So I feed into Python a list of, my, of the um, pages, a list of the pages I'm interested in. Uh, I run a scrape, uh, I run a script that scrapes the pages for for uh, HTML links, for inline links. And then that script saves the information in Semantic Media Wiki. So Semantic Media Wiki is based on the same um, platform that powers Wikipedia, but Semantic Media Wiki adds some semantic web features to the wiki. So it lets you define relationships between page and analyze relationships between page. So once I got the information into Semantic Media Wiki, I used uh, an extension of some, a plugin for um, Semantic Media Wiki that built those graphs very easily. And so um, there are many CMSs, con content management systems, that might have features for visualizing links this way or for managing links. Um, here at Google, we use our own custom uh, static site generator and so we work mostly with uh, markdown files that are generated then into HTML files. So by doing this, this was a way I could add some of those uh, CMS features to a system that doesn't have them. So I'm using uh, Semantic Media with the Semantic Media Wiki as a CMS to analyze another CMS. So why do you have your custom static site generator as, as opposed to one of the thousands that are out there? Uh, Google, we like to do things our own way, I <laughs> suppose is a short answer. And that is my time. Thank you, everyone. So yes, rights we code. Um, I do not, oh, hey, I am not involved with them at all, uh, but I just really, really like the conference, and I wanted to talk to you guys about why you should consider going. So it is a conference for women in tech, and I realize that we're not all women. So if you are not, then I highly encourage you to bring this to the women in your workplace and encourage them to go, because it is great. So what is their pitch? Um, as you might imagine, Write Speak Code is focused on kind of encouraging women to engage 
with the broader tech community. So we know that the tech community is mostly male, um, and I think they would like to work on that. So this is their pitch. Um, what are non-binary people? Um, people who don't identify with either gender, or, or people who are born intersex, I think. Um, if somebody has a better definition, let me know. I thought I meant to do binary <laughs> um, So people who don't feel like they're either female or male. Um, so. Who all was there? Obviously women and non-binary people. They had pronoun pins, which was a super nice touch. Um, and then it was mostly developers and software engineers, but there were lots of other folks too, and I would uh, encourage tech writers to swell the ranks next year. <laughs> so the structure, um, it was basically three and a half days, um, three really long days, and then a half day on a Saturday. Um, and there were two tracks, so I'm only speaking to the first year track experience. I was not part of the alumna track. So day by day. Uh, the great thing about it is that they combined um, lots of different talks with actual um, workshop type activities. So you felt very hands-on every single day. Uh, the first day, you wrote a biography, uh, which would be useful for speaking in front of a conference. Uh, the second day, you got the chance to brainstorm, write, and then deliver that very day, like a five minute or 10 minute lightning talk. Uh, the great thing about that is they also matched you up with somebody with more talking experience or speaking experience. And so you got feedback from that person as well as feedback from people who were uh, more like peers. Um, coding day was also super fun. Uh, the way they had it set up was to encourage people to contribute to open source. Um, and they were very smart about that. They, partnered with a lot of different, um, different open source products and had like prepared issues for different people to work on, um, as well as people that you could contact um, with the organization. And in some cases, they had people from the organization there to help you work on various coding problems. Um, they also emphasized that you could work on docs. Like docs are an important part of open source and you should uh, consider that a great way to contribute. Um, and they were also like, sure, you can work on personal projects if you don't want to work on open source. Um, and then career day or self-care day was great. One minute, right. <laughs> so we'll keep going. Um, highlights, it was super awesome. It was very small, so you could meet with a lot of people very quickly. And action-packed. Um, so why should you go since you're a tech writer? Um, stretch your coding skills. The open source day was great to partner with more skilled coding type people. So if you are interested in that, or if you are a really strong coding type person, um, you gain confidence in speaking and presenting, which I really enjoyed, and you get to learn about open source, which I didn't really know much about other than the philosophy behind it, and you meet a lot of amazing people, which I can attest to. So hopefully that caught me up. <laughs> Great. That is everything. <laughs> um, so my name's Nico. Uh, I'm an organizer for Write the Docs SF. Um, and also, I work at Square. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about organizing for Write the Docs SF. Um, so just in case we have any new people, uh, Write the Docs SF, it's just a local monthly meetup. Um, and we meet and we talk about software documentation stuff. And the members don't just have to be technical writers. It's really just anyone who's interested in the docs. Um, so our main responsibility um, organizing for Write the Docs is to plan these meetups. Um, and that usually includes uh, choosing the topic um, and then finding a presenter, or not if there's no presenter, um, and like also preparing the materials and uh, finding a venue and going to the meetup. Because if you're the one who organized it, you should probably be there. <laughs> um, and so uh, the way we work is we usually just um, discuss things through email, and um, we take turns organizing the meetup. So there's four of us right now, so that means that we each organize one every four months, which is kind of nice. Uh, we don't get like overburdened with things. Um, and we're really collaborative. We don't have any sort of hierarchy, or we don't have any senior members or anything. We kind of just talk stuff out um, and then come to a consensus. Uh, and we try to keep it really low pressure. So like if you've got stuff going on at work, or your personal life is on fire, that's fine. You can just tell us that you need to step back for a while and then, you know, whatever. Uh, oh, and we found that the, the time commitment seems to be around seven hours a month, including the two hours that is the meetup. Um, that can be higher or lower depending on if you're 
organizing a meetup um, that month or if you have taken on another project to have. Um, there's a lot of really cool benefits to organizing for Write the Docs. You get to know a lot of other technical writers. Um, you get a little bit of vi visibility in the community. Um, it's a good way to practice public speaking or socializing if you're super shy, like me. And um, it's also a humongous help when you're job searching. I just finished up my job search this past month, and people seem to really like to see that you're an organizer. I think it's because you can say like really cheesy things like, I love documentation, and they'll believe you because you do this stuff. Um, so it's good. Oh, and uh, as an organizer, you get a guaranteed spot at every meetup. So sometimes if we have like a really cool topic, um, the guest list will just fill up, but you can go. Um, so. Uh, if you are wondering to yourself now, uh, or thinking like, gee, I'd really like to volunteer, but I don't know if I'm qualified or like if I have uh, anything to offer, let me tell you that you do. Please help us. We need you. Um, you know, obviously it'd be really cool if you have um, like lots of ideas for how to make things greater here or like you're really outgoing and stuff, but that's not necessary. If you're really shy and or um, if you're new to technical writing or organizing meetups and you um, you want to get involved, it's totally appropriate and cool to just come up to us and say, hey, I want to get involved, but I don't know how. We'll tell you how and we'll, we'll just teach you everything you need to know. Not a big deal. When I joined, I didn't know anything, nothing at all. Um, so. I have a slide that has like this humongous list of stuff that you can do if you want to, and the slide is available. Um, there's like a link to the slides on the the meetup page. Um, so you know, but the the whole point of this humongous list is that there's a bunch of things that you can do, and you can choose the stuff that fits your skill set. Um, or if it's not in your skill set yet and you want to get better at it, you can pick it anyway too. I think this is a really cool way to like get better at different skills. Because um, it's, it's not too bad if you mess up, but if you do good, then it's really good. Um, so, um, again, you know, if you have any questions, you can email me, Nico, or Laura, or uh, Juan, or Monique. Um, and, uh, oh, and I have a sign-up sheet, so I'll put that. Gee, where will I put it? I'll put it on this chair. So if you feel like you want to sign up, then come to this chair after, after all the talks. Um, all right, that's it. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hello. My name is Robin Pilla, and I came here today to convince you all to use your amazing documentation skills to help out in volunteer work and nonprofits. And I want to clarify up front that when I say use your documentation skills, I don't actually mean write docs for free. Although you can certainly do that and there are a lot of nonprofits who could totally benefit from that, but I actually am talking about the broader set of skills that we as technical writers have all developed because those are the skills that I think are uh, make us really well qualified to make very impactful contributions to volunteer um, opportunities. So I'm talking about things like our organizational skills. Uh, we know how to create order out of chaos, or at least chaos adjacent situations. <laughs> and uh, we're also naturally born communicators. We really know how to listen and ask lots of questions and then translate that information that we hear in a way that makes it possible for other people to do their jobs better and be more effective. That's really, really valuable. And also, we're really good at balancing the details and the big picture at the same time. This is like daily bread and butter for us, right? We're responsible for getting the details right, but we're also doing that always within the context of our organization's overall goals and priorities. So these are all things that really set you up for excellent success and a great impactful contribution um, in a nonprofit or any other volunteer opportunity. So how do you go about finding those skills-based volunteer opportunities? It's something that may be not very obvious because maybe a lot of volunteer opportunities that you see advertised aren't anything to do with the skills that you already have. So I have three major suggestions for things that you might look into if this is something that's really interesting to you. The first is to look into organizations that offer some kind of upfront training or orientation because they're interested in letting you uh, get started in quickly in their organization, but then make a more long-term contribution. So for example, Reading Partners works this way. You go in for a just one hour orientation and you pass a background check, 
and then after that they'll match you with a student who's struggling uh, with their reading skills and you will meet with them one-on-one -on -one, an hour a week throughout the school year and you help them get up to speed on reading and comprehension and if you play your cards right you might actually be able to make them into a technical writer of the future <laughs> which is something I'm working on so it's really it's a really great way to give back because you're making a really big contribution just from that one student's life However, not everybody can work at the same time an hour a week during the school, uh, the school day. I know that's not something that everybody can do with that flexibility. So you can also look for that same, uh, that kind of thing, but that uh, for organizations that offer a more flexible schedule. So for example, Dress for Success will have that same one hour orientation up front where they tell you all about all the opportunities that they, uh, that they have for volunteers and all the different expectations for those things. And then you get access to their volunteer portal. And so you can sign up for individual ad hoc slots for things that match your skills and that work for you for the timing that you have available. So for example, I work in their career center helping women who are prepping for interviews with uh, their resumes and uh, doing you know, sort of one-on-one -on -one interview prep. That's really great. So that was the first way. That was only one. <laughs> the second one that I would suggest is to consider joining a nonprofit board. This is something that I never considered before a friend of mine who's on multiple boards uh, told me, like, you know, this is a really great way to use the skills that you've built in your career and make a really big impact in a cause that you care about. And so what you would do on a board is work with the other board members to forward the interests of that organization. You govern and you advise. And it, it can be really exciting. It can be very different depending on what board you join. You can sometimes do interesting committee projects that, you know, can, there's a wide variety of things that could come up. Uh, have if you done this? I have just started, so I'd be delighted to tell you more about it next time when I've had my second board meeting. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but if you are interested in learning more about being on a board, I would ex encourage you to check out Board Match. It's an organization that matches potential people who are interested in joining a board with nonprofits who are looking for new board members. So they have meetings uh, in various locations around the country every year. The, the one in San Francisco that's next will probably be in March. So you can go, it's another uh, a great way to also find out about other volunteer contributions that you could make at those organizations. And uh, so lastly, if none of those things seem like your thing, then maybe just think about inventing your own thing. We're all pretty tech savvy here, so you can start a meetup or, I don't know, volunteer at a meetup that already exists, right? <laughs> or, uh, you know, like start a Slack. Uh, if you see something that uh, needs your skills, there's a problem that you can point your skills at, absolutely go for it and uh, bring other people along with you. Because that's the, that's the final point, I would say. No matter what it is that you do, tell your friends and your colleagues about what you're doing and why it matters to you. Because the more people you can inspire and bring along with you, the more good that you're actually doing. So that's really great. All right, thanks. I'm Richard Pfeiffer. I'm a technical writer at Genesis. I work on API docs and complex backend stuff. I've been reading a book about style lately. It's called Clear and Simple as the Truth, Writing Classic Prose. And it was written by Francis Noel Thomas and Mark Turner. Towards the end of the book, they mention some stylis stylistic issues that relate to technical writing. I'm going to quote them at length here because their points are insightful. Quote, you may want to do this. Um, it is a universal and accurate complaint that manuals that come with machines, by the way, that's the book, manuals that come with machines, universal and accurate complaint, that manuals that come with machines from computers to automobiles and books of instruction that come with everything from tax forms to garden furniture are unintelligible, close quote. A universal and accurate complaint, they say, unintelligible. Frustration at this unintelligibility, they continue, is intensified by the certain knowledge that the writer of the manual or books of instruction or, instruc or instruction booklet actually, uh, uh, let me say that again. Frustration at this unintelligibility, they continue, is intensified by the certain knowledge that the writer of the manual or instruction booklet actually knows what the reader wants to find out. <laughs> the reasons for this infelicity are many, but one of the most prominent is that no individual passage not even the first one, seems to be independently intelligible, close quote. <laughs> the authors think they know why, as they put it. In a manual or instruction bo booklet that succeeds, the writer is trying to put the reader where the writer is standing. He already knows how the thing works, 
and he's trying to position the reader to know the same thing, close quote. To put it simply, successful technical writers differ from those who aren't so successful by posing a basic question. How can I position the reader to know what I know? Their determination to answer this question leads these writers to modify their mode of expression, to develop a style that bridges the knowledge gap in a way that the style of other writers does not, so that the things they write are in independently intelligible. For Thomas and Turner, the way we view our relationship with our readers is just one of several intellectual issues that are foundational to both our writing in general and, more specifically, to our style. They spend a large part of their book examining these issues, unfolding this exploration around what they call classic style, referring above all to the crisp and elegant prose of great 17th century French writers like René Descartes or Madame, Madame de Sévigné. And in fact, their goal in discussing these issues is to help people master this classic style. Fortunately for us as technical writers, although classic style is different in many ways from the kinds of style we most often use, it also has a lot in common with them. Because of this, there's a lot we can learn from this book. Here's an example, quote, classic style models itself on speech and can be read aloud properly the first time. In speech, an expression is gone the moment it is spoken and has only that one instant to enter the mind and attain its place in memory. Since classic writing pretends to be speech, it never requires the reader to look forward or backward. Each phrase is presented as if it has only one chance now to do its job." Close quote. This is just one example of the kinds of questions the authors bring to our attention. By shedding light on the conceptual underpinnings of style, they can help us work towards clear and simple styles of our own so that we too can be successful. I hope you can find your own style. After all, hard things that need to be easy are everywhere around us. Just think what we can do if we ask the right questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, hi everyone, I am Al Nelson. I'm a freelance technical writer. I specialize in uh, software documentation and uh, API docs, blog content, basically anything that you need written that's, that's technical, I've, I've been working on. And uh, I wanted to talk to you today about automating the docs. And what I mean by that is when I've worked for several companies as a solo tech writer and sometimes you have a whole lot of content to deal with and you run into this dreaded problem, documentation debt. <laughs> you hear about technical debt a lot, but documentation debt is also a big problem because when you're working on documentation and always adding new features and release notes and all the things that engineering is working on, you sometimes let the old docs fall behind and stuff gets out of date. There are little things here and there that you need to update and it's hard to keep track of it all. So how do we stay sane in this constantly changing workplace? How do we update our docs and also continue to provide new content at the same time? So I'm gonna talk about some of the problems that I've faced and things that I built to solve those problems and uh, give you some resources to help you in your own workplace. So here are some problems that I had at my last company. We had a lot of old or broken links that were going to the wrong places. We had uh, version number changes when we released a new version of the software. Sometimes we changed the name of libraries or packages and we needed to go through and re replace all those names. Uh, we'd have little updates or fixes where, say, we, we um, updated how you installed a package or added a new command or just something that you needed to do a little change to, but it was on a lot of different pages. And then, of course, there's new content for your features. And last but not least, we have search and discoverability, which is similar to what Juan was talking about with the TOC problem. 
you can have the best hierarchy in the world, but if your readers and your customers can't find what they're looking for, then it's all for naught. So here are some things that I built to deal with this. Uh, I, I built a uh, script using Beautiful Soup in Python that goes through and scrapes all the pages in our documentation looking for links similar to what Juan did. And uh, at my old company, we were, we were using Confluence. So I was looking for links that were pointing to older versions of our Confluence spaces. And what I did was, so it would crawl all the pages in our documentation hierarchy, look at those links, and then it would pick out all the ones that were pointing to our older spaces or had, that were pointing to like basically the wrong link. And I set it up so it would email me with a report of like, here's all the links that are wrong. Here's all the links you need to fix. And that was a lot more useful for me than just going through and saying, oh no, there's hundreds of pages. I don't know what's wrong. Uh, another thing that helped when you're dealing with a big set of documentation is single sourcing. And so you would set, um, it was kind of hard to do this in Confluence, but I built a workaround where you could set variables or uh, pages with the content that you wanted to easily change. And then you would just include that content instead of typing it out manually on each page. So when you update things in one place, it would be reflected across the documentation. For the little changes and things that you need to update here and there, you can use batch processing and just knock out a bunch of those at the same time. And uh, for the search problem, I built a Slack integration for our company where uh, the support team, they would be on chat support with our customers a lot. And what I built was where our support team could search the documentation from within Slack. And it would surface those results right within the Slack channel, which allowed them to get answers quicker. And uh, basically, that is the gist of what I've been working on. Uh, and yeah, I've got some code examples on my GitHub. They're pretty old, but um, you can definitely check it out. I call it non-fluence, just as kind of a pun <laughs> on confluence. But uh, yeah, you can email me, tweet me. You can even hire me if you want to. So thank you. <laughs> So I have no slides because Robin convinced me to give this talk about uh, five minutes before the meetup started. <laughs> Thankfully, I've already written a blog post about it, uh, so it wasn't that hard. So there's also that to make up for the fact that there's no slides. So we are a room full of people that care about words. That's why we're here. We love words. Um, but one of the things about words that can get overlooked or overtaken by marketing is the names of features and the names of things on the UI. Uh, so why does that matter so much? Obviously, marketing cares because it's really important for SEO. It has to be catchy and show up in a press conference and maybe something they can trademark later and sound really cool. Uh, but we should care a lot uh, because it matters for building or breaking a mental model that the users may already have. So uh, an example of this is, uh, sorry, Google, but uh, Google Plus versus Google Docs. Google Docs, you can quickly figure out, OK, what is this going to do? Uh, it's sort of building a mental model. It is Google and Docs at the same time. You can sort of guess and go explore more. Google Plus, got no idea, got nothing. Not even sure. Uh, and that matters as well, this mental model that you're building, because that leads to adoption and discovery. Uh, so the better a mental model uh, and the better mental model that a name evokes, the more likely people are to discover and explore your feature, and also the more likely that they're going to adopt it, because it makes sense. Because once they start using the feature, they will see UI text that makes sense. If you're building something about investigations, you want to hear about, oh, add something to the scope of your investigation, or here's some additional evidence that you might want to pull in, things like that, as opposed to some arbitrary software jargon that your engineers might feel more inclined to bring up. So how do you actually build and write decent, uh, decent feature names in UI text? It's really hard. 
Uh, if you're lucky enough to be having scenario-driven development, if you have these scenarios that you understand why might someone be using this, uh, what are they going to be doing with this feature, it's a little bit easier to say, well, we want them to be writing docs. Therefore, Google Docs makes a lot of sense. Um, if you are not really sure at all, you can just start doing word association. Just be like, okay, well, we're doing investigations. What words relate to investigations? And start to think about it that way. It's also important to test any feature names that you might come up with. Uh, and this is where diverse teams really, really, really matters. Um, I work for a company called Splunk. It's called that because of spelunking. Um, an extension to our software is called an add-on. Uh, but it was almost called a crampon, <laughs> which is fine if you're thinking only about spelunking, but not if you're a woman. Um, it's a little bit different. So diverse teams uh, involve those as well when you're developing your feature names and your UI text. So that's all I have. Thanks. <laughs>
the secret Sheba ending for a video game called Silent Hill 2, like where it turns out that a Sheba was controlling it all. <laughs> it's kind of silly. Um, then animations, uh, if you're doing it as an image, uh, a GIF, and I say GIF, GIF is peanut butter as far as I'm concerned, um, is the way to go. So here's a little image in a GIF, and it's huge. Animated GIFs are actually really big. That's 4,800 kilobytes, 4.8 megabytes. Um, but if I were to do it as a JPEG, I can make it way smaller, but it doesn't animate, so <laughs> that's not very useful. Thanks. Um, and you could say, well, what about video? I'm going to kind of skip through that. You can actually use a video tag, and that can be way better. But it's not as portable as an image format. For example, in this, that's what a video looks like. And so that's not always the right, right way to do that. Um, if you need transparency, PNGs are usually the way to go, um, often. Um, here's an example. It's 72 kilobytes. If I do that in a GIF, it's not that much bigger, but you'll see it's got that little halo around it because GIFs only have on or off on the pixels. They're either transparent or they're not. And so you don't get this little variation in color that you need on the soft edges of things to get sort of half pixels in a way. Um, and if I do a JPEG, I just get a big old box behind it. So <laughs> things are the way to go. But I had fun with this slide. That's not the whole story. Oh, I lost it. <laughs> Uh, if you're doing icons and many logos, and it's very simple, um, SVGs, and if you have access to the original file format, SVGs are really great for that. Um, and if you can get those from like your designers or things like that when you're writing documentation, that's great. Um, because this SVG, 0.3 kilobytes, that's really great. I can get a PNG. It's bigger. It's actually quite a bit bigger. But when we're talking about kilobytes, it's still pretty small. But where you really see the difference is when you make it larger. SVGs are infinitely scalable. The way that they're made, they're not in pixels, they're in vectors. Um, so this giant icon is the same exact size. And I can make it huge, and it's still the same exact size. It takes the same amount of space no matter what. Whereas the PNG, if I make it the same size, you can't see, but it's got a fuzzy edge on it. And I'm sure you've seen that in like people having little icon things, and they've got the fuzzy edge. It's a PNG that's like kind of fuzzy. Um, and I could make it so it's pretty smooth at that larger size, but then it gets bigger. So those are the things to think about with that. That I'm not going to talk about too much, but those are photo masks. The rest of these slides get into future image formats that are all big and fancy, well outside of my five minutes. So, <laughs> um, and, and I totally wanted to stop here anyway because that's where it gets useful. But you can find me as very thorough on uh, Write the Doc Slack or anyway. So if you have questions, ask me there. Thanks.